So today we are going to talk about um, the care of an infant uh, with a focus on respiratory support and intubation. We'll do this through the context of a case, which Dr. Kadi will discuss. Uh, we have three of our experts uh, that, that are going to be presenting and leading the discussion. First, Dr. Tammy Cotty, an associate professor of clinical pediatrics and emergency medicine at Georgetown. She's been an ED attending at MedStar Georgetown since 2004 and has served as and served as a pediatric hospitalist until 2009. Next is Dr. Lor Dr. Lauren Siegel. Uh, Lauren has been ED attending at MedStar Southern Maryland since 2019 and a nocturnist for the last two years. She's board certified in both emergency medicine and family medicine. Last is Dr. Neha Patel. Dr. Patel has worked as a pediatric hospitalist and a peds ED physician since 2004, and she joined Mets from Montgomery 12 years ago, where she now is the director of pediatrics. Uh, much of today's conversation will include various resources that I'll drop in the chat or others will drop in the chat, and I'll also include uh, ASEP's version of a pop-up on RSV bronchiolitis. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kadi to present the case. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So let's get started with our case. So we have a two and a half week old, uh, full term baby, uneventful pregnancy, born via vaginal delivery. All of mom's uh, labs were negative, who presents to the ER with about three days of runny nose, cough, baby has felt hot, but they haven't taken an actual temp and hasn't been nursing as well. And their diapers have been down as well. You note in your history that older brother who goes to preschool um, has had a recent URI, one of his many. But tonight, parents have been worried and brought the baby in for evaluation because they noticed that the baby was breathing very fast and sucking in their belly and chest wall muscles. So this is a very familiar sounding case to all of us. And let's just go through the vital signs. So baby's temp, and this is a rectal temp, 37, heart rates about 130s to 140s, breathing at a rate of 60, pressure 85 over 40, and sat 88% on room air. You look at the baby, you see they're active, alert, they have copious nasal <coughs> congestion and discharge, and you see that they're, they're actually working hard to breathe, you would say in moderate respiratory distress. They're tachypnic, they're having subcostal, intercostal retractions, they look well perfused. When you listen to them, you hear squeezing, ronchi that actually sounds like stepping, crackling on snow. So I think all of us have recognized this baby has bronchiolitis and this baby doesn't look good. But let's review some common um, pitfalls and places where we could do better and improve our care of this baby. So just generally speaking, we don't wanna be fooled, you know, think, oh, it's summertime, RSV can happen. You know, these viruses we can see all year long, usually classically RSV in the fall and the winter, but especially after the pandemic, all of the sort of usual time course has been thrown out the window and we're seeing these viruses all year long. And don't forget there's other viruses out there that cause bronchiolitis. Um, metanumavirus, we had a season a few years ago that, that was the big trigger for these bad sick babies with bronchiolitis, rhino, entero, flu as well. So now some points on kind of assessing the baby. And this is a real challenge in our current working environment with capacity space issues. But a lot of times we may be looking at this baby, they're bundled up in the stroller. We're just making our assessment based on, you know, looking at their face. But it is critical that we open up the blanket, that we undress this baby. Even if they're tiny, we gotta get this full evaluation. You need to unsnap that onesie, I always tell uh, the residents, because you can't assess the baby and know what's going on under that onesie without looking. Really looking at their chest wall movement. And again, assessing for respiratory. You may not get this from your triage vital, but it's critical in this age group to really assess for a full minute their respiratory rate. Um, you may remember that neonates and young infants may have what we call periodic breathing that I'm going to talk about shortly, the difference between that and apnea, um, but really counting for a full minute to have an accurate respiratory rate is critical. Then, as we mentioned in our case, what are the signs going back to basics of respiratory distress? 
Um, so first off, grunting. I know we were going to pop in the chat, possibly the actual sound on that, but maybe a little bit later. But that's our baby's version of auto peeping in the basic kind of sense. So you may see grunting. That Once you see that, that's pretty bad. Flaring of the nostrils, that baby's working very hard. And then retracting. So yes, you may just see some basic belly breathing, but what we're talking about here is full on retracting of all the chest wall muscles. It could either be intercostal, you know, um, subcostal. If you're seeing supraclavicular or suprasternal retractions, things have gotten really bad. So if you're noting these things after your full evaluation baby, it's really important to prioritize getting these babies back, not sitting out there in the waiting room or triage and getting them on the monitor. Again, we're not going to know if they're desatting if they're not on the monitor. Also a plug on at least a one-time rectal temporary assessment in the beginning, much more sensitive than axillary, tympanic, forehead thermometers. And in this age group particularly, it's going to help guide the, the fever workup. So just to pause here. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it's uh, is it if it's okay if I just share that YouTube video clip that you sent me because it's so it's so illustrative. Your baby may have breathing problems such as retractions, grunting, and apnea. Retractions are unusual breathing movements. With each breath, your baby's chest muscles pull in the skin around the bones. Grunting is a noisy breathing sound. Your baby may grunt to keep air in the lungs. Grunting may sound like snoring or singing. Apnea is a condition in which your baby pauses breathing for 15 to 20 seconds. Terrifying. then continues breathing. You may notice changes in your baby's skin. Two common findings are conditions known as cyanosis and jaundice. Cyanosis is a blue skin color. You can usually see it around your baby's lips, chest, and stomach. So right, we've we've recognized these signs, and I just want to pause here. Something that I think is important for all of us um, to really know where in your department are your essential pediatric respiratory supplies. Where is your Peds code cart, your airway box, your all your appropriate Ambu bags, your IOs. Um, so many of you work in many different ERs and have to be flexible with that, but. If you even just plan one day to come in a little early, meet with your equipment manager, nursing to just walk through um, where everything is, uh, you won't have those nightmares that a lot of ER people have at night where you don't have the right equipment to help a patient. So just to really put a plug on that can help reduce a lot of anxiety and in the moment be very comfortable with where everything is. That's the last thing you want to worry about is where your equipment. So. Um, moving on from that, so we'll go back to our case. During your evaluation, um, you brought the baby back, you got them on a monitor, you note that they're starting to have intermittent episodes like we saw in the video of apnea along with bradycardia and desaturations. You stimulate the baby, see if they'll come out of it. It's not really working. So uh, alarm bells are going off, but let's talk a little bit about apnea. Um, particularly with RSV, it's not really known exactly how this works, but it's actually a central apnea, um, thought to be like a neural reflex triggered, triggered in the upper airways. It actually has a pretty high incidence of apnea that almost 20% in those six months and under hospitalized for RSV. And what is even more scary is that usually apnea is an early event presenting before the respiratory uh, symptoms start. So that that's not enough to put the fear in you. Um, again, though, the apnea is usually seen in those under one month. They don't have to be just preemies. You can see it in the full term population as well. Again, thought to be connected to the viral virus triggering like this immature uh, 
respiratory drive or self ventilation. But what is, well, we got to define what is a clinically significant um, apneic event, similar to the video. So, we're talking about apnea that's either 15 or 20 seconds longer, bradycardia under 70 or 80 beats per minute, and then the desaturations under 85 or 80 percent. You may see cyanosis, but you don't always have to see cyanosis. Um, just to differentiate what I brought up in the beginning, apnea versus periodic breathing, which can sometimes be tough. So periodic breathing is normal in uh, neonates and young infants, but it's more of like a regular kind of recurring cycle of breathing, um, like 10 to 15 seconds interrupted by pauses of about three seconds, very self-limited, it goes back. So they breathe, breathe, breathe fast, then a little slow. Then again, breathe, breathe fast, a little slow. Whereas the apnea is true cessation of breathing for the 15 or 20 seconds or more. So um, any questions here? And otherwise I'll hand it over to Dr. Patel. Tammy, I have one, and then there's one in the chat I wonder if you want to address. I think Dave, Dave gave a great answer, but um, regarding temperatures, like at, at what point should you rely, at, at what point can we stop relying on a rectal temp, or is there an age cutoff? Yes, that's a great question, and there seems to be like this never-ending pervasive fear of the rectal temperature <laughs> everywhere, and, and the inpatient unit, I've heard it, you know, for such a long time. I think if you're workup is going to be driven by what that one number is. It's critical at least to have one, I'd say, in the under two-month population, like Dave mentioned, because that is going to affect your workup. Um, so I would, I'm going to talk a little bit about the fever workup later, but particularly under two months, a real accurate core temperature is going to drive, you know, what's next? Are you going to have to tap this baby? Are you going to have to do empiric antibiotics? So I would say it's important. And I want to clarify that piece because Dave, and I see your hands up. I read yours as two years. Is it two months or two years? Yeah, two years. Um, this uh, comes, we had a recent case, uh, a very unfortunate outcome in a uh, young baby that um, had a relatively benign presentation seemingly, and unfortunately had uh, a demise within a couple of days of the ED visit. Um, there was uh, a an axillary temperature documented on that baby. Um, which is not appropriate, and um, and this was a very young infant. So anyway, the um, the we did some research, uh, uh, you know, through our EMCPC to see what is recommended in the literature, and putting all those things together from the Emergency Nurses Association ASEP recommendations, AAP recommendations, ESI guidelines, uh, the ESI handbook, um, etc. Um, it seems as though the best practice is uh, that certainly any any child younger than two years, rectal temperature is the preferred route, um, and and some extend that up to three. So what we um, I, I just discussed this last week with our nurse leaders, and we're going to be looking to put this into action. But what will be uh, the new guideline moving forward um, is that any child two years and younger will require a rectal temperature. The only way out of it is if the family refuses and then the nurse would have to check, you know, document it within the EMR as to why it is that they're not documenting a rectal temperature. And between the ages of two years and three years, uh, it would be uh, recommended but not uh, mandated. It would be sort of uh, judgment as to whether it's an infectious presentation, you know, a minor trauma or something, for example, would not uh, warrant a rectal temperature in that case. But yes, two years or younger is going to be the new MEP uh, standard uh, very soon. And Dave, that's, I mean, if you have a kid that's a closed head injury who's 18 months old, are there going to be like, you know, disclaimers? We're talking about infectious process or it's all comers? All. The thought being that, uh, you know, sometimes you uncover things and uh, fever in a child, you know, of any age, um, it's a fever in a child that young, excuse me, uh, is of significance and we miss things. And this child uh, that we're talking about came in with poor feeding and a little bit of sniffles, right? And it's a slippery slope to start defining what is infectious and what's not. Um, so, uh, you know, the family has the right to refuse and we would just, the nurse would document that. Um, but that the expectation is going to be two years and younger is uh, rectal temp. Thanks, Dave. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I would just take that one step further and I'd say I think that we don't do rectal temps enough in adults either. I think that's super, super useful, helpful information. Um, Tammy, can you comment real quick about cyanosis identification in darker skinned individuals and if there's things that you look for, particular places that you look for that cyanosis? Yeah, that can be tough. And, you know, you're a lot of the mix up is when you're focused periorally. So really looking at the lips and the gums. Some say, you know, the soles and palms as well, but it definitely can be harder um, with darker skin. Yeah. OK, great. Great. Thanks. Thanks for starting us off. Um, Dr. Patel, now if I can turn over to you, just talk a little bit about the initial initial treatment, your approach. OK, so bronchiolitis is incredibly frustrating because there's no specific treatment. Um, there's no cure. Um, so it's all sort of supportive management. Um, but there are definitely things you can do to, to help babies and infants with um, bronchiolitis. Um, Number one, which we um, do a lot of uh, parent education about, is suctioning. Um, babies are obligate nose breathers, and when their no air, when their nose is blocked, obstructed with mucus, which it doesn't take a lot of mucus to obstruct an infant's nostrils. Um, you know, they they have increased work of breathing. Sometimes they become hypoxic, and just suctioning their nose is a, a, amazing in terms of improving their. Um, their um, uh, sometimes their oxygenation and their work of breathing. Um, we um, send babies home with the the blue bulb suction, but in the hospital we have the benefit of having the wall suction, which is probably underutilized. Um, uh, there are little um, adapters that that can be used. This is a I don't know if you guys can see it. It's a neo sucker, um, and it comes in different brands. But this is a neo sucker. Um, you can also use a um, five or eight French um, suction catheter um, at, with some saline to just flush out the the nostrils, and um, and that does usually does a good job in um, in just making them a little bit more comfortable. Um, these are, you know. These uh, suctioning is useful not only in um, kids who have mild distress, but also in um, kids who are who you are potentially going to start high flow and and you know it clears up the nasal passages passages and allows a little bit uh, better um, uh, better use of the high flow. Um, in terms of um, supplemental O2, um, if your baby's hypoxic, um, like the the baby in our example. Um, and in terms of hypoxia, you know, it's going to be something less than 90%. Um, we have a little bit more, um, we accept a little bit lower O2s as what we consider kind of normal in bronchiolytic. So, um, you know, sometimes babies can have 93, 94%, and we don't necessarily rush to put them on, on O2. We kind of look at the whole picture and work with breathing and all that. Um, so, um, um, you know, so if we're if we're worried about hypoxia and we want to start supplemental O2, really nasal cannula is the best best method. Um, if you have a blender at your institution, um, that's going to be preferable because then you can dial down the FiO2. Um, and um, generally, you want to keep the flow at less than two liters per minute. You know, you can start at one liter per minute or half a liter per minute, depending on what the um, you know how hypoxic the baby is, and then titrate it as you as you need to. Um, if um, you know if the baby is is showing a more moderate to severe um, respiratory distress, then um, you want to consider high flow. Um, and our sort of parameters, our vital sign parameters that we're looking for, are your respiratory rate. So. Um, if if the respiratory rate is above 70 or in the 60s or above 70, we're we're kind of thinking towards um, whether the baby would need high flow. You always, you also want to look at the work of breathing, um, as the video showed, retractions. If you have intracostal, subcostal retractions, um, if you have decreased aeration when you when you listen, other signs like other signs which are sort of more toward the severe respiratory distress would be the grunting, head bobbing, um, seesaw breathing. Um, 
and also level of alertness. So if the baby is lethargic or fu very fussy, inconsolable, those are also things to, to consider in terms of whether they're going to need high flow or, or more support. Um, when you start the high flow, um, the recommendation is to start the flow at about one liter per kilo per minute um, and maxing out at about 15 liters per minute. Um, your flow is the thing that's going to reduce your work of breathing. Um, and then you can titrate the FiO2 to um, keep your SATs above 90%. Um, the, um, the other things you can do to consider in, uh, uh, besides just um, supplemental O2 or high flow is um, treating the fever. Um, and obviously, as, as Tammy said, if you don't know the baby has a fever, um, then you're not going to treat the fever. And, and you know, babies are, can be in distress just from fever alone. So it's really important to know if the baby has a fever or not, and if they do, to treat the fever, because that itself can reduce work of breathing. Um, also, um, in terms of bronchodilators, racemic epinephrine, um, those things generally are not recommended or helpful in any way in the, the normal bronchiolytic. If there is a strong family history of reactive airway or um, you know, the, the baby has history of eczema or food allergies or, or A to P, then you can give a trial of albuterol, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's of limited benefit. Um, the, um, the other thing to consider is IV fluids. Generally, um, these babies have poor feeding. Um, they have increased in sensible losses from fever, um, and they can um, usually benefit from a normal saline bolus. Um, the other thing to consider is getting a, uh, a finger stick um, glucose. It's sort of our fifth vital sign, especially in, in neonates, because they, they can have um, um, hypoglycemia. Um, I, will, uh, I will let Tammy proceed with the, with the workup, um, fever workup, um, and unless anybody has any other questions. I, I just had a couple questions now. If, I, if I'm hearing mm -hmm. you right, if I'm hearing you right, it's largely around improve the mechanisms of breathing and decrease the demand by decreasing fever, I think was what I heard you say um, pr primarily. I am curious, I work at Hospital Center and I haven't fortunately taken care of a child in 15 years except for my own. Do we have the ability to do deep suctioning for neonates in all of our EDs? We should. Um, I mean, all you need is the appropriate sized catheter and um, and wall suction. Um, if you set the wa wall suction to 60 to 80 um, and then you have a five to eight French catheter, you should be able to do anybody should okay. be able to do suction. So I'll just call out a couple folks and ask like Sonia or Kevin or Diane, if you had to do that today, would you be would, do you have the equipment readily available to do it? Yeah, cool. I think we would use the, just the standard inline um, suction that we have, like for intubated patients. I believe that's what our respiratory therapists use. Okay. I think you can worst also case too, you could reach oh, out to, to the. I'm sorry. You can also reach out to your to your neonatology or labor and delivery, and I'm sure they would have the appropriate size catheter. Worst case, like feeding tube kind of MacGyver hookup, possibly could work, but. Well, it seems like such an important thing to do before you put somebody on high flow because it's going to work so much better. Um, that, that's, a, that's a great trip, great tip. Sonia? Along those lines, can I ask, is there any benefit ever to like doing a little saline flush in these kids' noses or is that just an awful idea? <laughs> for sure. For sure. Saline is very helpful because you're just you're flushing everything out and then using okay. the suction right after you flush it yeah. with saline. It just it's kind of like a, it's like a vacuum cleaner. It just <laughs> sort of flushes everything out. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, any other questions before we, we're going to stay on stay on workup um, with with Tammy, uh, unless there's any other questions. Can I just add, Sonia? I know that our respiratory therapists do do that when they're deep suctioning the kids at Southern Maryland. They will flush and help suction them out. Okay, Tammy, back to you. All right. Um, so in regards to workup. Um, 
get to fever in a second, but uh, chest x-ray, is it really needed or not? So classic bronchiolitis, AAP says you don't need it, but I think if a kid looks that bad, no one's going to argue with you on getting an x-ray, so I wouldn't stress over it. If you want the x-ray, get the x-ray. Um, in terms of swabbing, so um, it is going to be helpful, and particularly for cohorting for admission or transferring the baby, you're going to need to tell them if it's RS, at least RSV, flu, or COVID. Um, I know there's a lot of discussions back and forth about the cost of the full respiratory viral panels, but I'd say at least as a minimum, the RSV, flu, COVID are what you're going to need for getting this baby accepted to another hospital for cohorting or in your own facility. Um, is it going to change your own management in the ER? Probably not a huge amount. Um, and then now going back to fever. So two imports, important points on this. So this age group and really the under three month age group, 38 or 100.4 is kind of your trigger for more of a workup. Um, so that's important to know. Also important to know is even if they're afebrile in the ER, if the family reports that they had a measured temperature, regardless of the, the route of the temperature, even if they did an ear temperature, if they report that it was 38 or higher, that should pull the trigger for the workup as well, according to the literature. Um, and then in terms of, I, I just want everyone to be, we're going to, I think we just put in the chat, if you're not already familiar with the AAP's clinical practice guideline, on the management of the febrile infant. This was from uh, 2021. I would really take some time um, to be familiar with it. There's great algorithms in there that break down the under 21 work days of life workup, 21 to 28 days, which was where the major kind of change is, and then the 28 to 60 days. Um, I don't want this to turn into a talk about fever, but just to you know summarize, for our patient, two and a half weeks old, so under 21 days of life, um, even if RSV positive or flu positive, if it's true, you know, fever either documented by the history was taken or in the ER, um, even if it's, you know, bronchiolitis, they do recommend a full septic workup um, because you can still have that serious infection. We've had cases like this where, um, you know, there's been disagreement, but the and the conclusion was that the full workup should be done. And that that does mean, you know, the blood culture, CBC, urine, urine culture, and unfortunately LP, and then empiric antibiotics. And in this age group, you're either covering with ampicillin or gent or amp or cefetax. Um, because remember, we don't use ceftriaxone in under one month of age. Um, there's this theory that it can cause chernicterus or displacement of bilirubin. Um, if it between the 21 to 28 day range, and this is where the, the clinical practice guideline is helpful to review, you can actually use inflammatory markers to take the next step to say if you need to LP this baby or not. And I know different are different. We've heard that sites have kind of different um, capability on this, particularly procalcitonin, which is referred to in the um, article, if, if you don't have that readily available to come back in real time, then utilizing your CRP, your ANC, um, and then actually if the temp is 38.5 or higher, that's enough of an inflammatory marker positivity to say, okay, this baby needs an LP and empiric antibiotics. Great, Tammy, there's a question in the chat um, that I'll pose to you, uh, and I'll just read it out loud. Um, Coming, coming from adult studies, is there any literature for benefit of steroids for hypoxic sick children with PICU, in the PICU with pneumonia? Pneumonia itself is a whole different, I mean, bronchiolitis, lots of evidence to say no steroids. We still see it being done in the community and even in our own hospital, but lots of evidence to say no change in outcomes. Pneumonia, it's a little bit different story, particularly if there's underlying reactive airway or um, asthma, that there may be some benefit. Okay, and then going back to more of the situation you're speaking of, 
Another question, do you still proceed with a full sepsis workup, including LP and empiric antibiotics in neonates with positive viral tests? So yes, um, still the incidence of invasive bacterial infection or serious bacterial infection, at least in the under 28 day group, it's still pretty, you know, concerning that it is recommended to proceed, even if RSV positive or flu positive. Over that 28 day, there's more evidence to say the rates of bacteremia, meningitis, UTI are extremely low, that you don't have to do the full on workup. OK, great. Thank you. And great questions, everyone. Um, all right, Lauren, if I can turn to you. So. Um, taking on this child that's maybe on the sicker end of the spectrum. Can you talk a little bit about when you make the decision to intubate? Like, what, what are you using to make the decision to intubate? So there are three main things that you're going to look at clinically with the baby to decide about intubation. The main one being if they're becoming apneic. So if they're having multiple apneic episodes, that's right there is your indication for intubation. Um, as Tammy talked about earlier, it's more of a central apnea. And so if they're not, you know, responding to other treatments, um, if they're failing high flow, if they're persistently hypoxic despite aggressive oxygenation and suctioning and all of that. And then also, I don't think many of our institutions have CPAP or BiPAP for infants, um, but if they have failed that as well. So I have to tell you, if I witnessed one apneic episode, I think I'd probably be intubating the child. Like, is there a number? I mean, how many apneic episodes are you looking for? Um, that's a good question. I I think if if it's happening frequently, like more than you know three four times in a minute, I think you need to be considering it. Um, I'll defer yeah. to Tammy or Neha if they have any other thoughts. If it's intermittent and you're kind of stimulating them out of it, they're not um, fully decompensating. They could be some, you know, you could possibly, if you could get them on high flow quickly, you could trial it, but be ready, like have everything. We, ha we had a case like this last week at Georgetown in a four day old, um, and we ended up getting them on high flow, stabilizing them. And we were fortunate at Georgetown that the NICU whisked the kid away, but, um, I would recommend at least get them, if you can get them on the high flow quick, if you can't, then proceed with securing the airway. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that at least you, at least if it's very intermittent, if the episodes are inter intermittent, you can not you can give um, high flow a try. And sometimes just that flow of air in the nostrils provides the, the stimulus to kind of remind them to breathe. So just that, that flow sometimes does help quite a bit. So I, I would try it first rather than just immediately intubating. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Lauren, back to you. You've made the decision to intubate. Walk us through your prep and, and how you how you approach the procedure. Okay, so I think most importantly is you're going to want to have all of your supplies ready to go and everything available at bedside. You don't want to be scrounging, looking for things in the middle. So you want to have you know your plan A, your plan B, and have your backups just in case. Um, you're going to want respiratory therapy at bedside with you. Um, in this case, you're going to have to have a discussion with the parents. Um, you know, these are infants. This is scary for the parents. And it's a lot different when you're intubating, you know, an adult. So it is scary for them. They may or may not want to be in the room. They're going to have questions and you're going to need to be prepared to answer all of them. Um, you should already have IV access. If not, it's recommended to have IV access. If not, place an IO. Um, you're going to be pre-oxygenating them, usually with high flow nasal cannula. Um, usually they should have a 20 cc per kilo IV fluid bolus going, and then you're going to want to get your medications uh, ready for this. Usually in this age group, you can intubate with fentanyl and midaz, and that should usually be enough. Um, usually don't need a paralytic in this age group, but if you do, you know, rock your onium versus sucks. And then because they're less than one age, you are going to want to pre-medicate with atropine because they are prone to bradycardia. And then after intubation, you're going to want to have those medications ready as well. And again, in this age group, it's going to be fentanyl and midazolam. I know most of our institutions do not have capabilities for drips. So you're probably going to just be bolusing these kids with doses. Um, there is no role for propofol in this age group. Um, and 
that's what I would have ready on hand. Sure. So I think um, most folks are going to prefer DL, but I'm just curious in this sample size we have here, if any folks have used GlideScope in the ER setting in this age group. Yeah, feel free to unmute or type in the chat. Okay. So, I mean, if, if you feel comfortable with that, you have the equipment, go for it. Um, but probably still the majority are you doing direct. Um, you're using a Miller zero or one. Then the question always comes up, are we going to use an uncuffed ET tube or a cuffed tube? So what's the current recommendation is using an uncuffed for neonate only. Everybody above neonate gets a cuff. So you're grabbing either an uncuffed two and a half or a three. Um, ET2. Let's say you're having your worst nightmare, nothing's there, or you can't get the airway. Think about a superglottic airway. Um, size one is the smallest um, and would be for this age group. We're on um, the PEDS QS committee. We've had to the past years work through an equipment list, but we're now particularly going to just focus on superglottic airways. We've kind of compiled what each site has in stock and try to make that more uniform so that backup option is available for, for the IGILs, which um, is the current type. Don't forget these kids have huge occiputs, so really utilizing that towel roll under their shoulder to open up the airway. Great, and I see uh, a comment, a couple comments about an S1 glide scope. I'm assuming that's the size blade that you would use in a, an infant, is that is that right? I am not familiar. I don't I haven't used the glide scope in this age group, so I'm not exactly sure um, it's, what's the smallest. It's the smallest that they have, and it's um, it's still a hyperangulated blade, though. It's not a Miller blade. We have okay. both, like Miller and hyperangulated. OK, great. Um, and uh, Lauren, just to go back, just to clarify the propofol um, comment, there's a question in the chat about propofol being contraindicated. Is, is it true that it's contraindicated in those under three years of age? I haven't heard about three years, but I know it would be contraindicated in this age group. Um, I would have to get up for the three years. Yeah, and yeah, um, I haven't I haven't heard that far out under three, but would have to double check. Um, I see Kevin had a question uh, about order set. We do have the EDP's intubation order set that Dr. Siegel put together that I believe has all those medications on there. Um, and I think there was a it was a question about propofol infusion syndrome, which which maybe has a higher prevalence in in kids. But yeah, I don't know if there's a contraindication, but we can follow up on that and get back to you about that, Jamie. Um, great. Now. Uh, Diana, go ahead with the question. So, Manish, you guys did the study on uh, post-intubation sedation, and uh, I think that's a really hot topic in the adult population, but um, I have a feeling that kids might suffer from even greater undertreatment post-intubation um, in terms of sedation post-intubation. I was wondering if we have any data locally on that. Um, and if there can be any comments, because we've had a couple of cases of patients who were intubated and uh, uh, either from vomiting or coughing or movement, the ET tubes got dislodged. And I think it's so easy to dislodge the ET tubes in this population. So if you guys could comment a little bit on the post intubation, because oftentimes we get we, we secure the airway and we feel so confident and we feel that we've won the battle. Um, and then the tube gets dislodged, and that second intubation is often unsuccessful, and then it becomes a very terrible situation. So if you could just comment a little bit on post-intubation sedation, that'd be great. Yeah, Diana, that's a fantastic question, and th thank you for pointing that out. I, um, two, two points. One, um, 
in our 2019 database, it's a completely unexplored space. We haven't we haven't looked at our infant and our and our child intubation. And if somebody's interested in working on that, I'd be happy to partner with you. Um, the second part is that that's the exact topic that Neha is segueing into um, is post intubation care. And so Neha, I wonder if you can talk a bit about um, how you might set the vent as well as sedation um, and, and anything else that you think is important. Sure, I'll give a I'll give a plug to Lauren's um, worksheet on um, intubation checklist and giving some um, um, setting parameters and stuff like that. Which I'm not sure, Manish, where that's going to be um, posted. Uh, it just went on mepcc.net. It was a, re a revision to a document that existed, and there's a link in the chat. Okay, so um, so you know, at this point, if the babe once the baby's um, on a vent. Um, I, you know, you probably are starting to think about if you haven't already transferring the baby um, and getting, um, you know, some PICU input. So I think at, by this point, you should have already sort of um, gotten some PICU input. And so, um, you know, to do this in um, in consultation with with the PICU attending is is important. Um, the um, general, generally for the settings, you know, the tidal volumes for neonates um, should be set at um, four to six um, cc's per kilo, um, and your rate is, is going to be around 40 to 50 um, for neonates, um, and the PEEP is about three to five. Um, in terms of um, sedations, um, I know many of our hospitals don't have the, the ability to run um, drips. Um, drips would be um, better, um, then you don't keep, need to keep on giving bolus dosing. And then I think, um, you know, you can achieve better sedation um, and not have dislodged um, ET tubes and such. Um, so, um, you know, I think everybody has a little bit of a different preference. Um, my preference from a pediatric background would be to do fentanyl and midazolam, but um, everybody has a little bit of a different preference. Um, I know some some ED attendings like propofol. Um, you know, I, I, it's it, that one is is a little bit, I guess, a little bit of a con controversial one. But um, in terms of um, um, you want to also place, remember to place an OG tube um, to, to limit abdominal distension. And, um, you know, hopefully at this point, you know, you're going to have, um, you know, you're going to fly the baby out or get the baby out pretty quickly after this. So hopefully it's not a long term sort of vent management. Um, and sort of the other sort of th things to think about are, um, you know, um, is sort of working with RT and working with your your um, accepting institution to um, to find out sort of what the what the best um, future management is for um, you know getting getting the baby settled and all that. Great. All right. So if I can, this kind of brings us towards the end of the um, the discussion we were planning. If I could just maybe summarize a couple of the key points that I heard. Um, and then, um, and then we'll we'll get into some of the, the questions that are coming in. So, um, I heard some of the most important things are recognition, and so just to kind of give us the best data, literal use of of uh, rectal temp, and we're making a a system wide uh, process change for that, which is great. Ensuring that we are um, unbundling children to make sure that we're getting the best look at their thorax, looking for retractions and grunting and apneic episodes. Um, making sure that we're using suctioning, specifically deep suctionings with oxygen, with uh, saline maybe, um, fever control to decrease the, their worker breathing uh, and, and their oxygen demand, um, and then supplementing with oxygen, moving quickly to high flow nasal can cannula at a, a, a liter per kilo flow, IV fluids as needed. Um, a really important point, familiarizing ourselves with the equipment that we have um, in our sites. Um, and then kind of granular information using an uncuffed ET tube for neonates less than a month, using atropine as pretreatment in those that are less than a year, um, and then fentanyl and midazolam most commonly used, probably boluses in our environment and generally don't need a paralytic. Um, those are some of the key points that I heard. I, I don't know if there's other key points that anybody else wanted to add as you're either saying those or, um, or uh, uh, typing them in the chat. I'll, I'll read the comments in the chat. So yesterday night, transferred a 20-month 
hypoxic child on high flow nasal cannula, and the consulting PICU asked for a capillary blood gas. Uh, not super familiar, but is this comparable to a PAO2 for an ABG? Tammy or, or Neha, I wonder if you, one of you could address that. Yeah, I, I think they're mostly doing it for the for the CO2. For the, yeah, the PCO2. I, I don't find it as helpful in you know our setting. It, like you're going to gain that much more information over the appearance, but it's true. The units will generally do it when they arrive there, but it's not going to make a huge difference in our emergent management of the patient. Also, just to tag on to the, your summary, Manish, I, I don't believe we discussed this, but don't forget your Braslev tape. And also, I really want to put a plug in for an app that I have no financial interest in called PDSTAT. If you haven't downloaded it already, it is a real lifesaver, and it will give you all your equipment sizes, how far to put the ET tube, all your bolus dosing. So it's called PEDI and then STAT. And so just to make sure that I understood that part about the capillary blood gas, it, it, it sounds like it's just like using a, a venous CO2 just to look for CO2 clearance. Is that is that right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. Dave had a, a good comment in here about, about RSV testing. Dave, do you want to maybe make that comment verbally? Yeah, thanks. Um, and the case that you guys just presented, obviously, that's, you know, sort of a kitchen sink moment. You're going to do all the testing. You're going to do an x-ray. You're going to do blood work. You're going to do all the things, right? So uh, the question I have is is really about a different population of patients. These are the the happy uh, wheezers, so to speak. You know, the kids who come in and they're, um, you know, 18 months old or uh, 12 months old. They have classic presentation of bronchiolitis. They have this sort of rancorous uh, breath sounds that, that you were describing like stepping on snow um you know that all those things it's sort of a slam dunk that this is bronchiolitis um but they look well you know they're they're not dehydrated they're taking po well uh you know and they're not in any severe restorative stress they're not hypoxic these are this is a child that you'll be able to send home and the the question is about testing viral uh testing for for those patients and the reason i ask is that um somebody mentioned earlier you know viral panels and the you know the, the fact that those get denied by insurance companies quite regularly i can tell you that that is absolutely true um and uh you know it's a it's a significant expenditure of time and resources not to mention money to acquire those tests and they the aap makes it very clear that they don't recommend routine testing um, but we, you know, it is still happening with some regularity. So having said that, um, you know, I, I know the AEP recommendations and guidelines, but obviously there's sometimes practical considerations. And I'd be curious to hear the expert panel opinion on the value or lack thereof of testing, viral testing in these kids who clinically clearly have bronchiolitis and are dischargeable. Um, so I, not to speak over, but I I think the flu, the RSV, and the COVID would be the three. I don't think that there's an indication for the full respiratory viral panel on a kid that's going home, but I think a lot of daycares required to know if there was COVID or something like that, and so it might be important for the families to have that information for their ability to go back to school or, or daycare, in which case that's when I would test at least for those three. I also have to say, since COVID, parents are very savvy um, in these terms, and from a patient satisfaction point of view, um, the times when I've said it's not going to change anything, they're like, well, I want to know. And the times pre-COVID where I didn't test, it kind of came back to me that the my pediatrician, then I followed up the next day, did it, and you guys did. So sometimes patient, is it you know, we always say, what's the right thing to do? Is it going to change man management? Is it financially savvy? Probably not for them going home. But from patient satisfaction, it might still be important, especially now post-pandemic. Great points. Thank you. Uh, 